The shuttle docks with a jarring clank, jerking me back to reality. I'm at the orbital prison, a monstrous structure orbiting a desolate planet, its cold, metallic skin reflecting the harsh light of a distant star. As the doors slide open, a wave of artificial stale air hits me. We're herded out like cattle, guards in high-tech armor flanking us. One barks, move, keep it moving. Their faces hidden behind visors show no emotion, but their rifles ready and threatening speak volumes. Walking through the narrow steel corridors, the sounds of the prison come alive. Distant clanging of doors, muffled yells, the mechanical hum of the station. A prisoner next to me mutters, Hell in the stars, this place. We reach the processing area. Methodical and uncaring, the guards strip us of our belongings. Everything off now, one commands. My past, a decorated covert military career, means nothing here. I'm just another number. Changing into the rough fabric of the prison jumpsuit, I hear a gruff voice from the next row. What are you looking at? It's a challenge, a warning. Eyes avert quickly in this place. The finality of my situation sinks in as they lead us to our respective cells. Mine is small, with just a bunk, a toilet and a small viewport. A guard smirks. Enjoy the view. It's all you got now. As I sit on the bunk, the cold metal seeping through my jumpsuit, I realise the true horror of this place. It's not just the confinement or the company of the galaxy's worst. It's the erasure of our pasts, our humanity. And as the lights dim, signalling the night cycle, I lie there, staring into the void, lost in thoughts of what awaits me in this orbital hell. In the orbital prison, time loses meaning. Days, indistinguishable from each other, blend into a monotonous cycle. The routine is suffocating in its predictability. Eat, work, sleep, repeat. The mess hall is a chaos of clattering trays and muffled conversations. Guards stand on raised platforms, their eyes scanning constantly, fingers always near the triggers of their stun rifles. Keep the line moving, one barks as we shuffle forward to get our rations. The food is bland, a mush of nutrients, but it's fuel, nothing more. Work is gruelling. We're assigned to maintenance tasks within the prison, fixing conduits, cleaning and other menial tasks that keep the place running. It's back-breaking work, and the overseers are unforgiving. Faster, you're not on vacation, snaps an overseer as I tighten bolts on a panel. I keep to myself, speaking only when necessary. Friendships in prison are liabilities, potential weaknesses to be exploited. I observe instead the dynamics, the unspoken rules, the hierarchy that forms among the prisoners. There's an economy of favours and threats, a delicate balance maintained through unspoken agreements and swift violence. In the yard, the only time we see the stars, conversations are terse, often whispered. Stay out of trouble. A grizzled inmate advises me one day, his eyes darting to a group of inmates who run the black market within the prison walls. Nights are the hardest. Locked in my cell, the silence is oppressive. The faint hum of the station's life support systems is the only sound. Occasionally I hear the muffled cries or shouts from other cells, signs of the despair that haunts these walls. I lie awake on my bunk, staring at the metal ceiling, the harsh reality of my sentence weighs heavily on me. Here in this orbital tomb, life is reduced to its most basic elements. Survival, obedience, endurance. The routine is a chain, as binding as the walls that confine us. Each day blurs into the next. A relentless march of time marked only by the changing of the guards and the dimming of lights for the night cycle. Sleep while you can, a guard sneers during lights out his voice echoing down the row of cells. But sleep doesn't come easy. In the orbital prison, even dreams are a luxury too costly to afford. The tension in the orbital prison grows, an undercurrent of unrest stirring beneath the surface of monotonous routine. Whispers of rebellion ripple through the ranks of prisoners, passing like a clandestine breeze from one ear to another. 
I overhear snippets of quiet conversations in the shadows of the work areas and in the corners of the mess hall. Something's coming, a wiry inmate mutters to his companion as they huddle over their meal. Their eyes flicker with fear and anticipation. I notice a change in the guards, too. They're more vigilant, their patrols more frequent. Their usual nonchalance has been replaced by a noticeable edginess. Commands are sharper, punishments more swift. Back to your cell now! One guard snaps over something trivial, his hand resting uneasily on his weapon. In the yard, the tension is almost tangible. Groups of inmates cluster together, speaking in low, urgent tones. I see alliances forming, lines being drawn. There's a sense of impending storm, a feeling that something is about to break. Even the most hardened inmates seem restless, pacing their cells or staring blankly into space. The usual prison politics and power plays take on a more desperate tone. They're planning something big, a grizzled lifer confides in me during work detail. Just keep your head down. I stay alert, watching for signs, for any indication of what might be coming. In a place like this, information is as valuable as currency, and I've learned to listen more than I speak. But the uncertainty is unnerving. In the orbital prison, chaos is always just a spark away. One evening, as the lights dim for the night cycle, the tension seems to reach a crescendo. The usual night sounds of the prison are drowned out by a feeling of restlessness. I lie on my bunk, eyes open, senses heightened. It begins with a scream, raw, piercing, full of terror and rage. It cuts through the stillness like a knife, and in an instant, I'm awake, every nerve in my body tensed for action. More screams follow, a pandemonium of chaos that erupts in the once silent corridors. I hear the unmistakable sounds of a scuffle, the heavy thuds of bodies hitting the metal floors, the zaps of stun rifles firing. The prison, a sleeping giant, awakens into a nightmare. I jump off my bunk, pressing my face against the small viewport of my cell door. The hallway is a maelstrom of violence. Prisoners, some I recognize, others I don't, clash with guards. They're armed with makeshift weapons, shivs, clubs fashioned from broken parts of the prison itself. It's not just a riot, it's a rebellion. The guards are outnumbered, their usual air of authority stripped away in the face of raw, desperate fury. A guard falls, his stun rifle snatched up by eager hands. The power dynamics of the prison shift in real time, the oppressed suddenly becoming the oppressors. Alarms blare, a shrill, unending siren that adds to the pandemonium. Red emergency lights bathe the scene in a bloody hue. I see faces contorted in anger, in fear, in exhilaration. Shouts and orders are lost in the bedlam. The violence is not just senseless brutality. It's the pent-up rage and despair of years, maybe decades of mistreatment and dehumanization, exploding all at once. For the prisoners, this is more than an escape attempt. It's a reckoning. I grip the bars of my cell, my mind racing. Escape is possible in this chaos, but so is death. I watch as a group of inmates overpower a guard station, seizing control of the cell block. They move methodically, a unit forged in the furnace of shared suffering. The cell door across from mine swings open, and an inmate steps out, his eyes wild with fear and determination. It's now or never, he shouts to anyone who'll listen, beckoning to others to follow him. I'm faced with a choice, to stay in the relative safety of my cell or to step into the storm of violence and desperation that the prison has become. The chaos of the outbreak is like a raging river, and I find myself caught in its current. Around me, the prison is a complex of violence and anarchy. Inmates fueled by years of oppression fight with a ferocity born of desperation. Guards outnumbered and overwhelmed struggle to regain control. The air is dense with the smell of sweat, blood, and fear. I move instinctively, relying on my black ops training. Avoiding direct confrontations, I weave through the battling bodies, always on the lookout for an escape route, a way out of this madness. 
My heart pounds in my chest, adrenaline coursing through my veins. Every shout, every gunshot heightens my sense of urgency. In the midst of the chaos, I spot it. A chance. A door, usually secured and guarded, is ajar, left unattended in the commotion. It's a narrow opening, but it leads to the lower levels of the prison, a place rarely mentioned and shrouded in rumours. I don't hesitate. Ducking under a swinging pipe, I make a beeline for the door. A guard spots me, raising his stun rifle, but he's too late. I barrel into him, sending us both crashing to the ground. His rifle skids across the floor, out of reach. I don't stop to finish the fight. I have only one goal. Reaching the door, I slip through it. The corridor beyond is dark, a clear distinction from the red emergency lights of the cell blocks. It's quiet here, the sounds of the riot muffled by thick walls. The lower levels of the orbital prison are a maze of pipes, cables and narrow walkways. I move quickly but cautiously, aware that this area is unfamiliar territory. The prison's secrets are hidden here, in these neglected, shadowy corridors. As I move deeper, the temperature drops, the air grows colder. I can see my breath in front of me, a reflection of the precariousness of my situation. Every step is a gamble, every turn a potential trap, but there's no turning back. The door to the upper levels has shut behind me, locking automatically. I'm committed to this path, to finding a way out or at least a place to hide until the chaos above subsides. The lower levels are a place of forgotten rooms and abandoned projects. I pass through areas that look like they haven't been used in years, covered in dust and cobwebs. It's a different world down here, one that feels removed from the reality of the prison above. I keep moving, driven by a primal urge to survive. This is no longer about a calculated escape plan. It's about making it through the night, about staying alive in the heart of darkness that the orbital prison has become. Descending into the lower levels of the orbital prison is like stepping into another world. The chaos and violence of the riot above seem distant, as if belonging to another reality. Here the atmosphere is starkly different. It's darker, quieter, more sinister. The only sounds are my own footsteps echoing off the cold metal walls and the distant, muffled sounds of the prison's unrest far above. The lighting here is sparse. Every so often the flicker of a failing light creates momentary pockets of darkness that I approach with heightened caution. I move carefully, aware that these lower levels are uncharted territory for me. In my time in the prison, I'd heard rumours about these areas, tales of forgotten cells, experimental facilities, places where the worst of the worst were kept. But rumours were all they were until now. The layout is confusing, a seemingly endless maze of corridors, closed doors and sudden dead ends. The signs and markings on the walls are faded or unhelpful, offering no guidance. It's clear that this part of the prison was not meant for regular use, or perhaps it was abandoned for reasons unknown. Every step I take is calculated, my senses on high alert. I'm aware that this place might hold dangers different from those above. There could be forgotten inmates, left to fend for themselves in the bowels of the prison, or automated security systems still active, waiting for an intruder like me. As I move deeper, I come across rooms that hint at the lower level's purpose. There are storage areas filled with old equipment, supplies that look like they haven't been touched in years. In one room, I find rows of what look like old control panels, their screens dark, coated in dust. The silence is oppressive, making me all too aware of my isolation. In this part of the prison, cut off from both guards and fellow inmates, I feel a creeping sense of vulnerability. I'm on my own, with no one to watch my back. In the depths of the lower levels I make a startling discovery. Turning a corner in the seemingly endless maze of corridors, I find myself facing a heavy reinforced door, markedly different from the others I've encountered. It's slightly ajar, an unusual oversight in a place governed by strict control. Pushing it open, 
I step into a room that starkly contrasts with the rest of the prison. It's a laboratory, hidden deep within the bowels of this colossal facility. The lab is sprawling, filled with equipment and machinery that look both sophisticated and ominously utilitarian. Rows of computers and monitoring equipment line one wall, their screens dark, but not dusty. In the centre of the room, there are medical examination tables, some still holding straps and restraints. Along another wall, I find rows of cabinets, some left open to reveal an array of medical tools, vials of unknown substances, and stacks of folders and documents. The room is abandoned, yet everything is too orderly, too well maintained for it to have been left unused for long. It's clear that this place was in operation until recently. The question that pounds in my mind is, what were they doing here? I approach the computers, hoping to find some answers. Pressing a power button, I'm surprised when the system whirs to life, its screen flickering on. The interface is unfamiliar, but I manage to navigate through files and folders, my eyes scanning quickly for anything that might shed light on the lab's purpose. The documents I find are troubling. They're filled with technical jargon, but the implications are clear enough. There are experiment logs, medical reports, and what appears to be research on human subjects. Many files are encrypted, but those I can access paint a grim picture. The experiments seem to range from psychological studies to more invasive procedures. There are references to behaviour modification, endurance thresholds, and something cryptically labelled as Project Revenant. The subjects are all referred to by numbers, dehumanised in the cold clinical language of the reports. I also find surveillance footage, some of it recent. It shows prisoners being brought into the lab, sometimes forcibly. The videos are disturbing. I see fear, resistance and in some cases, what looks like subsequent disorientation and compliance. This discovery sends a chill down my spine. This lab, hidden deep within the prison, was a hub of clandestine activity. The effects of what was being done here to fellow inmates, possibly without their consent, is horrifying. It's a violation of every ethical standard, a dark secret that the prison, or those who operate it, clearly wanted to keep hidden. The more I uncover, the more the horrifying reality sets in. The orbital prison was a covert testing ground for experiments that violated ethical boundaries. The documents are printed reports and digital files, each revealing pieces of a larger, more sinister puzzle. Some papers are so recent that their ink seems barely dry. They detail a series of experiments conducted on prisoners, tests that range from psychological manipulation to bio-enhancement trials. One folder, labelled with a bold red confidential stamp, contains detailed records of behavioural experiments, these involve sensory deprivation, extreme isolation, and stress endurance tests. The cold, clinical language of the reports masks the cruelty of the procedures. Subjects are referred to by numbers, stripping them of their identity, reducing them to mere variables in a grotesque experiment. Another set of files pertains to medical trials. They speak of drug testing, genetic modifications, and even surgical enhancements aimed at creating superhuman abilities or altering physiological responses. The notes mention side effects, severe pain, disfigurement, psychological breakdowns, as if they were minor inconveniences rather than human suffering. I come across video logs, some showing interviews with subjects before and after experiments. The contrast is chilling. Vibrant personalities turn vacant, rebellious spirits become docile. It's evident that whatever was done to these inmates, it left them irrevocably changed. Amidst the technical details a project name keeps reappearing, Project Revenant. It seems to be the umbrella under which these various experiments fall. The aim, however, is not entirely clear from the documents I can access. Bits and pieces suggest a goal of creating enhanced beings, but the purpose remains shrouded in ambiguity. The horror of my discovery sinks in. This prison, 
a place I believe to be a simple, if harsh, facility for containing criminals, is a facade. Behind its walls, inmates are not just serving time. They're guinea pigs in a series of inhumane experiments. I feel anger, disgust, and a growing sense of dread. These secrets paint a picture of a conspiracy that goes far beyond the confines of the prison. I'm standing in the epicenter of a moral catastrophe, one that threatens to redefine the very nature of humanity's approach to incarceration and punishment. A subtle noise breaks the heavy silence of the lab. It's a faint, almost imperceptible sound, like the rustling of cloth or the soft scrape of skin against metal. My heart rate accelerates, a primal response to the realization that I am not alone. Slowly, I turn towards the source of the sound, every sense heightened. In the dim light of the lab, a shadow moves, subtle but unmistakably deliberate. It's lurking in the far corner of the room, partially obscured by a row of old equipment. I stand perfectly still, trying to peer through the darkness. What emerges from the shadows is something beyond comprehension. A figure, yes, but distorted in ways that go against natural physiology, its joints bending at unnatural angles. The skin is a patchwork of scars and grafts, the work of countless surgeries. Its movements are jerky, yet fluid, like a creature trying to understand its own form. The realization hits me with a wave of horror and pity. This is a product of the experiments, a living proof of the atrocities committed here. It's as if the very essence of a nightmare has been made flesh. The creature's eyes find mine, and in them I see a flicker of something painfully human, a remnant of the person it once was. In this moment, I understand the full extent of what has been done. These experiments weren't just about testing limits or creating enhancements. They were about fundamentally altering human beings, twisting them into something unrecognizable. The creature makes a sound, a guttural, pained noise that is neither speech nor a growl. It's a sound of confusion, of suffering. My initial impulse is to flee, but something holds me back. This being, this victim, is as much a prisoner as I am, perhaps even more so. As I stand there, frozen, Another chilling thought comes to mind. The rebellion was no mere coincidence. It was a release mechanism, a part of some twisted plan or experiment. The chaos above, the unlocked doors, the conveniently unguarded path to this lab, it was all orchestrated. The creature takes a step forward, its movements hesitant. I back away slowly, not out of fear of the creature, but out of respect for its tragic existence. I exit the lab, leaving the twisted result of the orbital prison's experiments behind. As I leave the confines of the lab, the reality of my situation becomes crystal clear. I am being hunted. The creature from the lab, a harrowing blend of prisoner and experimental subject, has taken to stalking me through the shadowy corridors of the orbital prison's lower levels. Its presence is a constant, looming threat, an unpredictable force of altered humanity. The corridors feel more oppressive now, the darkness more consuming. Every creak and groan of the prison's structure sets me on edge, every shadow a potential hiding place for the creature. It's an enemy unlike any I've faced before, physically altered and mentally unpredictable due to the experiments it has endured. My training as a black ops operative has prepared me for many scenarios, but this is uncharted territory. Traditional combat strategies are of limited use here. This creature's capabilities and limitations are unknown. It moves with a strange erratic grace, its body a manifestation of the unnatural alterations it has undergone. The sound of its movements is sporadic, sometimes a distant echo in the corridors, other times alarmingly close. It's clear that it is familiar with this terrain, using the shadows and the layout to its advantage. I realize that my usual methods of evasion and stealth might not be enough. My heart races as I navigate the maze-like lower levels, every decision critical. 
I choose my path carefully, avoiding open areas where I might be easily seen, sticking to the cover provided by the dense network of pipes and machinery. I listen intently, trying to gauge the creature's position, to anticipate its movements. The creature seems to be toying with me, occasionally revealing itself only to vanish into the shadows. It's an unnerving game of cat and mouse, one where the roles of predator and prey seem to shift constantly. At one point, I round a corner and come face to face with it. For a moment, we stand there, sizing each other up. Its eyes, still retaining a glimmer of human intelligence, seem to be assessing me, trying to decipher my intentions. Then, with a guttural sound that chills my blood, it retreats into the darkness, leaving me alone in the silent corridor. I press on, aware that each step could bring me into another encounter with the creature. The hunt is draining, both physically and mentally. I'm in a state of constant vigilance, my senses stretched to their limits. The narrow, winding corridors feel like a tightening noose, each turn bringing me closer to an inevitable clash. The confrontation comes suddenly, a burst of violence in the oppressive quiet. I round a corner and there it is, the creature, barely a few feet away. It's a grotesque silhouette against the dim light. Its altered form, a nightmarish vision. There's no time to think, only to react. The creature lunges with a guttural roar, its movements a blend of human agility and something unnaturally quick. I dodge instinctively, my training kicking in. I manage to sidestep the initial attack, but the creature is relentless, driven by some unfathomable instinct. Our battle is swift and brutal. The confines of the corridor leave little room for manoeuvring. I rely on close combat techniques, aiming to incapacitate rather than kill. The creature, however, seems to have no such reservations. Its strikes are wild but powerful, fueled by a combination of rage and pain. I block and parry as best I can, but the creature's strength is formidable. It's clear that the experiments have enhanced its physical capabilities. Each blow I land seems to barely affect it, its body enduring punishment that would incapacitate a normal human. In one heart-stopping moment, the creature grabs my arm, its grip like a vice. I feel a surge of panic as it pulls me in. I manage to land a solid punch, targeting a sensitive spot. The creature recoils, releasing its grip but not before leaving a deep gash on my arm. The fight takes a toll on me. I'm skilled in combat, but I'm also human, vulnerable to pain and fatigue. The creature, however, seems to be driven by something beyond mere survival. It's as if the pain only fuels its rage, making it more determined, more dangerous. Finally, sensing an opening, I make a risky move. I feint left and then roll right, slipping past the creature. It's a narrow escape, and I can feel its fingers grazing my back as I break away. I don't stop to look back. Adrenaline pumps through my veins as I sprint down the corridor, my wounded arm throbbing painfully. The creature doesn't pursue immediately, perhaps disoriented by our scuffle or biding its time. As I move deeper into the bowels of the orbital prison, nursing the wound from my recent confrontation, I come across a hidden chamber. It's different from the others, more like a control room or surveillance hub. Rows of screens, some still flickering with life, line the walls. It's clear this room was used to monitor various parts of the prison, including the lower levels and the lab. I approach the console, my curiosity overcoming the pain and fatigue. The screens flicker with static-laden images of different areas of the prison. One shows the aftermath of the riot in the cell blocks, another the deserted corridors of the upper levels. But it's the documents scattered on the console that catch my attention. I pick up a stack of papers, the top one stamped with a high-level clearance code. As I read through them, a chilling picture begins to emerge. The experiments conducted here were not isolated to the prisoners. They were part of a larger, more insidious program, that encompassed the entire prison, including the guards and staff. The documents reveal that the guards were also subjects of behaviour modification experiments. 
Techniques varying from psychological conditioning to pharmaceutical regimens were employed to enhance obedience, aggression, and loyalty. It was a systematic program designed to create the perfect prison staff. Efficient, ruthless, unquestioning. The staff too were manipulated, though in subtler ways. Their quarters were laced with pheromone diffusers and subliminal message emitters to maintain morale and compliance. The prison was experimenting on human behavior and control. I find detailed reports on Project Revenant, the umbrella term for these experiments. The aim, it seems, was to create a self-regulating facility where every aspect, from the prisoners to the people running it, was part of a controlled, closed ecosystem. The prison was a microcosm of a larger vision, a testbed for techniques that could be used for broader social control. The rebellion, the documents suggest, was an unintended consequence, a miscalculation in their experiments. It wasn't just a random act of violence. It was a reaction, a breaking point for both the prisoners and the guards, who were unknowingly being pushed to their limits. As I stand in the control room, surrounded by the evidence of this grand, twisted experiment, I feel a surge of anger and betrayal. We were all pawns in a game played by unseen masters, our lives and minds mere variables in their equations. The guards, the staff, the prisoners, we were all victims of a larger plan, a scheme that sought to redefine the boundaries of control and human autonomy. Survival in this twisted environment necessitates adaptation, and often adaptation means forging alliances, however uneasy they may be. The notion of trust in a place like this is tenuous at best, but the circumstances have forced my hand. As I cautiously navigate through the dim corridors, I encounter a group of prisoners. They are a motley crew, diverse in their origins and the crimes for which they were condemned. But here, in the bowels of the prison, those differences seem inconsequential. We are all fugitives in the eyes of our captors, all prey in this dark, enclosed hunting ground. Their leader is a burly man named Wraith, who was imprisoned for piracy. His reputation is that of a ruthless individual, but his eyes betray a sharp intelligence and a calculated approach to survival. We meet in a tense standoff, our mutual suspicion hanging in the air like a thick fog. We don't need another mouth to feed, Wraith growls, eyeing me warily. I'm not here for charity, I respond, my tone even. I have information about this place, about what they've been doing to us. We can help each other. A flicker of interest crosses Wraith's face, and after a moment of contemplation, he signals for his group to lower their makeshift weapons. Speak, he commands. I share what I've discovered, about the experiments, the manipulation of prisoners and guards, and the true nature of the orbital prison. My revelations are met with shock, anger, and a grim sense of validation. These men and women had sensed that something was amiss, but the depth of the deception was beyond their imagination. Wraith's eyes harden with resolve. We need to get out. Spread the word about what's happening here. I nod in agreement. But first, we need a plan, and we need to stick together if we're going to survive. The Alliance is born of necessity a fragile coalition held together by a shared goal of escape and revelation. Trust is a luxury we can't afford, yet there's an unspoken understanding among us. We are each other's best chance at survival. We begin to move as a unit, sharing resources and knowledge. I teach them some of my black ops tactics while they share their understanding of the prison's layout and routines. Our skills complement each other, creating a synergy born of desperation. We decide to sabotage the prison as a statement, a resounding declaration against the atrocities committed within its walls. The plan is audacious, a series of coordinated strikes targeting the prison's key systems, the power grid, the communication network, and the central control room. Sabotaging these would not only cause significant disruption, but also send a clear message to the authorities and hopefully, the outside world. Wraith, with his knowledge of piracy and hijacking, takes the lead in devising the technical aspects of our plan. I contribute with my tactical expertise, 
turning our limited resources into strategic advantages. The others, each harboring a burning desire for retribution and freedom, lend their skills and insights, forming a plan that is as daring as it is desperate. We move in shadows, our actions cloaked in secrecy. The prison, despite its chaos, is still a fortress, with surveillance systems and patrols. We avoid detection through a combination of stealth, timing and sheer luck. Every step we take, every move we make, is a dance with danger, a flirtation with the thin line between life and death. Our first target is the power grid. Located in a heavily guarded section of the lower levels, it powers the prison's critical systems. Wraith and I, along with two others, navigate the maze-like corridors, avoiding patrols and using maintenance tunnels to reach our destination. The power grid room is a fortress unto itself, but we come prepared. Using a combination of stolen keycards and brute force, we gain entry. Inside, Wraith works swiftly to rig an improvised explosive device, a concoction of stolen chemicals and jury-rigged electronics. The plan is to cause enough damage to disrupt the power supply without endangering the lives of those we aim to free. Next, we target the communication network. Our goal is to sever the prison's ability to call for external support, to isolate it from the outside world. This task falls to two other members of our group, skilled in electronic warfare. They set out to plant a virus in the communication system, a task that requires infiltrating one of the upper-level control rooms. The final and most daring part of our plan is the sabotage of the central control room. It's the nerve center of the prison, overseeing everything from cell doors to life support systems. Our approach here is more subtle, a plan to override the control systems and open the doors to the cells, to give every prisoner a fighting chance. The culmination of our audacious plan unfolds with precision and chaos. We had orchestrated our moves carefully, but in the volatile environment of the orbital prison, unpredictability is the only certainty. The first sign of our plan's execution comes as a deep, reverberating boom that echoes through the prison's lower levels. The power grid, now a mangled mess of metal and wires due to Wraith's improvised explosive, ceases to function. The immediate effect is obvious. Lights flicker and die, plunging the corridors into an semi-darkness, illuminated only by the emergency backup lights that cast a haunting red glow. The disruption to the power grid sets off a chain reaction. Alarms blare, a symphony that adds to the confusion and panic already present from the ongoing chaos of the rebellion. Guards scramble, their sense of order and control visibly crumbling as they try to comprehend the extent of the damage. Simultaneously, our team responsible for sabotaging the communication network succeeds. The virus, meticulously coded and deployed, infiltrates the system, severing the prison's link to the outside world. Their ability to call for reinforcements or coordinate a counter-response is effectively neutralized. The most critical phase of our plan, the takeover of the central control room, unfolds with heart-pounding intensity. Our group, a blend of determined former prisoners and broken but resolute individuals, storms the control room. The guards, already disoriented by the loss of power and communication, are quickly overwhelmed. With control of the room, we initiate the final act of our plan, the release of the prison population. The doors to the cells hiss open, a sound that resonates like a declaration of freedom throughout the facility. The prisoners, confused yet quick to grasp the situation, pour out of their cells a tidal wave of pent-up anger and desperation unleashed. But our victory comes at a cost. The explosions, though intended to be controlled, cause more damage than anticipated. Structural integrity alarms wail, a dire warning that parts of the prison are on the verge of collapse. We realize that our window for escape is rapidly closing, that the prison could become our tomb if we don't act swiftly. The race against time begins. We navigate through the mayhem, a chaotic exodus of prisoners all seeking the same thing, freedom. As we move, the cost of our actions becomes evident. 
Injured inmates and guards alike lie amidst the rubble, victims of the very chaos we instigated. Guilt tugs at me, but the urgency of escape leaves no room for remorse. Our path leads us towards the docking bay, where transport shuttles are docked. It's our only chance for escape, our only hope of taking the truth about the orbital prison to the outside world. The explosions have weakened the prison's defences. Amidst the confusion, I spot a figure trying to slip away unnoticed. It's the warden, the man who oversaw the horrors of the orbital prison. Driven by a need for answers, I follow him, leaving my fellow escapees behind. I corner the warden in a secluded part of the docking bay, just as he's about to board an escape shuttle. The confrontation is tense, charged with the weight of all the suffering he has overseen. His usual composure is gone, replaced by fear and resignation. Why? I demand, grabbing him by the collar. Why all of this? The experiments, the manipulation! The warden, wounded and defeated, looks up at me with defiance and despair. You think I wanted this? He gasps, blood trickling from a wound on his temple. I was following orders just like everyone else. Orders? From who? I press, my grip tightening. From the top, from the galactic authorities, he reveals, his voice barely a whisper. This prison. It was a test bed, a prototype for a new kind of warfare. Psychological manipulation, behavioral conditioning, bio-enhancements. They wanted to see how far they could push, how much they could control. I reel back in shock, the consequences of his words sinking in. The orbital prison was a laboratory for experimenting on the very nature of human resilience and obedience. The rebellion? The riots? It was all part of the plan? I ask, my voice a blend of horror and disbelief. He nods weakly. They needed a crisis, a scenario to test the limits of their experiments. You, the prisoners, the guards, you were all pawns in their game. We weren't just fighting against the tyranny of a prison. We were unwitting participants in a grand twisted experiment orchestrated by unseen forces. As I stand there, the weight of the truth heavy upon me. The warden's life slips away. His final breath a sigh of a man trapped in a game much bigger than himself. I leave the warden and make my way to an escape shuttle. As I pilot the shuttle out of the docking bay, leaving the burning wreckage of the orbital prison behind, the full reality of what I've learned sets in. I'm free, but the freedom is tainted. The real horror wasn't the prison itself, but the minds behind it. The galactic authorities, figures of trust and power, were the true architects of our suffering. They watched us, manipulated us, used us as lab rats in their scheme for a new kind of warfare. As I steer the shuttle towards an uncertain future, the weight of this revelation bears down on me. I'm free from the physical confines of the orbital prison, but I'm now imprisoned by the truth. The knowledge of what I've been a part of, of the extent of manipulation and deceit, is a burden I will carry with me always. The stars ahead offer no comfort, only a vast, empty expanse that mirrors the hollowness inside me. I am a man who has escaped one prison, only to find himself trapped in another, far more insidious one, the prison of a truth too heavy to bear.